Thank you, Chris. It's my pleasure to uh, represent the Social Science Department tonight and introduce our, our speaker. But first, I'd like to uh, thank the Diversity Learning Center on behalf of the Social Science Department for their help in bringing Matt Taibbi here to Grand Rapids Community College. Without their logistics and financial support, the social sciences would not have this terrific opportunity to supplement our curriculum tonight and offer this speaker to our students. Matt Taibbi is the author of Griftopia, one of the most entertaining, quotable, scathing, and illuminating histories of the economic crisis. In 2008, he won the National Magazine Award for his columns in Rolling Stone, where he serves as a reporter and a contributing editor. He is also known as the author of The Great Derangement, a terrifying true story of war, politics, and religion. And backstage, uh, it was interesting to have him tell me that he also served uh, and played in one season in the Mongolian Basketball Association in Mongolia, where he was known as the Mongolian Rodman. So <laughs> uh, I would have liked to have seen that. Uh, but he's here tonight because of his most recent book. Um, the New York Times bestseller, The Divide, American Injustice in the Age of the Wealth Gap. Matt Taibbi takes readers on a galvanizing journey through both sides of our new system of justice, the untouchably wealthy and the criminalized poor. As he narrates these incredible stories, he draws out and analyzes their common source and unveils what we need to do to stand up against the troubling trend of the divide. It's my honor to introduce Matt Taibbi. Thank you so much. Um, wow. First of all, I want to thank um, Chris and uh, Professor St. Clair and um, Mr. Light and all the folks at the Diversity and Learning Center who um, made it possible for me to come to GRCC and, um, and appear here. Uh, it's an incredible honor and frankly a little bit intimidating to stand uh, on this spot where people like uh, Malcolm X and Clarence Darrow, who were my childhood heroes, um, they stood in this very spot. And that's um, a little bit scary, but it's a tremendous honor. So I'm very, uh, very glad and very grateful uh, to have been brought here today. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, may I also add that this is by far the coolest podium that I've ever <laughs> spoken on. Uh, in my entire life, I feel kind of imbued with power up here. So, uh, so thank you for that. It's a beautiful facility. Um, so I'm here to talk about The Divide, which is a book about uh, the disparity in the criminal justice system. And um, I really came across this topic uh, by accident. And I think some of the best ways to talk about the issues in this book, um, the easiest way is just to describe my own journey into the subject matter because um, it was very much by accident and I learned so many interesting things along the way. Uh, prior to 2007 and 2008, uh, I worked for Rolling Stone primarily as what you would call a political humorist. Uh, I did a lot of campaign trail dispatches, and mostly what I did is I would follow around politicians and write these uh, goofy and sometimes biting profiles and, and often just sort of made fun of them. And, and uh, really the idea was just to sort of follow people on the road and, and, and talk about how interesting and strange the campaign process was, which was a little bit fun, but as, a, as an investigative reporter, you know, I had spent over a decade in Russia writing about corruption in the Kremlin and all these things, I, it, it was a little bit frustrating to me as well because I always sensed that there was some m deeper and more interesting, more complicated story under the surface of uh, what we normally encounter in the campaign trail, uh, which is usually very superficial and very repetitive, and, and that was a source of great frustration to me. And then in, um, in 2008, uh, there were a couple of really uh, key moments in my life. Uh, one took place in, um, uh, in July of 2008. Does everyone remember the whole drill baby drill thing? Anybody out here? 
Um, so this was, uh, I was following John McCain's campaign, and I was with the traveling press, and uh, McCain uh, unveiled a new version of this speech uh, where he was addressing a problem that was in the news at the moment uh, in America, uh, which was uh, the gas prices were soaring. And McCain's answer to this was that we had to deregulate um, the industry and allow oil companies to drill in the Gulf of Mexico, and somehow, magically, that was going to make gas prices go down immediately. Uh, and he gives a speech to uproarious applause in, in a place called Kenner, Louisiana. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge hit on the internet, on cable. Um, but all the reporters, as we're filing back into the plane on the tarmac later that night, um, as an aside, I should just sort of point out that campaign reporters, all they do is pick on the candidates behind their back. They, but to their face, it's completely different. But uh, behind their back, that's all they do is make fun of the candidates. And uh, so we're filing into the plane, and um, one of the reporters is really busting on McCain. And he's saying, God, you know, what an idiot. As if, as if drilling in the Gulf of Mexico has anything to do with gas prices going up. And I kind of raised my hand, and I said, um, does any of us actually know why gas prices are going up? And it was like the cartoons with the crickets, you know? Like, literally nobody in the plane um, had the faintest clue. And um, I turned to uh, one of my colleagues who I'll describe as a, um, a prominent television personality uh, who was sitting next to me on the plane, and I said, um, doesn't that make us all frauds? Uh, and he looked at me and he said, you're only figuring that out now? And, uh, and so I was worried by this. Obviously, reporters, you know, we often pretend to know about things that we know nothing about. Um, but this seemed to me a little bit of a bridge too far. Uh, and then, fast forward a few months later, uh, we're at the Republican convention, and then the same thing happened. We're, we're uh, covering Sarah Palin's speech, I remember. Uh, and, of course, we all remember this moment. It was this electrifying moment in American political history. We all rushed to the filing room after the speech, and we all knew that this was this thing we were going to remember for the rest of our lives. And we, all the reporters are turning on their computers to, to write their stories about the speech. And we see on the internet that, that the economy, world economy, is about to collapse. Uh, and there are all these news stories um, emanating from Wall Street about these venerable companies that are on the verge of bankruptcy. And, I'm reading all these stories and, and I'm, I'm searching sort of in vain for an explanation. Like there's a lot of what in these stories, but not a lot of how and why. Uh, and so they were like saying that companies like AIG and, and uh, Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch were in terrible trouble, but they weren't really, these stories weren't explaining anything about what, what the problem was. So I, again, I sort of went around the room at the filing room and I polled individually uh, all the reporters said, does any, do, do any of us have a clue about what is causing any of this stuff? And it, one by one, all the reporters look, looked up at me and went like this. Uh, and, you know, this is supposedly the cream of the political crop, you know. It's not just any room of journalists. We're supposed to be the very best political reporters in the country. And not one of us had, a, had even the remotest clue about what was going on, what was behind, what would turn out to be the singular economic event, certainly, of that decade, and, and perhaps, you know, next to 9-11, this, this, the most important political event of that decade as well. Uh, and we were completely clueless. And this was very troubling to me. And this, it was exacerbated, because as soon as I got home from that story, filing that piece, my editors at Rolling Stone uh, sort of cheerfully assigned me a story about the causes of the financial crisis. <laughs> so here I am completely clueless. Um, I had already you know, started trying to investigate the situation myself because I didn't want to be talking out of school about a subject that I, that I was completely ignorant about, but I, I was really at square one. It was so bad that, um, and the academics in this room can appreciate how desperate this is, but I was, I was actually reading The Wealth of Nations uh, and you know, people like Hayek and Friedman. Like, I, I thought I really needed to start at basic economics uh, before, I, before I could learn about this story. And, you know, four or five weeks into this assignment, I was getting nowhere. And um, I was randomly calling people on Wall Street and basically saying, can you tell me something about something? Uh, and 
through this process, I stumbled upon this guy who was a trader at one of the big banks who had a hobby that was really interesting. Um, in his spare time, he made these really nasty satirical cartoons about Wall Street. Uh, one of them was called Goldman Superheroes. Uh, and he, um, he invited me to lunch. So we went to lunch in Chinatown in Manhattan. And uh, he said to me, after five minutes into the conversation, he said, look, your problem is that you're trying to cover this as an economic story. This is not an economic story, it's a crime story. And once you get that, the whole thing will become simple to you. And he pointed out the window, how many people have ever been to New York? Anybody? Okay, it's a sizable number. So one of the things you will see very often in New York City is people selling phony stuff. So fake Prada handbags, do not buy the Prada handbags when you go to New York. Uh, fake Rolex watches, uh, fake Gucci wallets, all, all that kind of stuff. And it's especially common in Chinatown and we happen to see some people uh, selling phony handbags out of the back of a trunk. And he said, that right there is the key to the subprime mortgage crisis. Is that instead of phony Prada handbags, what they were doing is selling phony AAA rated securities. Um, and this is a complicated subject to the, the mechanics of actually how the subprime mortgage scam worked. They actually are a little bit complicated, but the underlying thing is actually all, not all that hard. It really is just a, an exalted, exaggerated version of a common street scam. What these folks were really doing, these banks that were lending uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to lenders like Countrywide, who in turn fanned out into primarily middle and low income neighborhoods, and they gave loans out to anybody and everybody. Um, one company, Countrywide, there was a whistleblower who later explained that their policy was that they would give a loan to anybody who could, quote, fog a mirror. Um, in another company uh, I talked to, it was sort of a Countrywide type lender. Uh, one of their bro brokers told me that his method of getting homeowners or finding homeowners was to hang out at the beer cooler at 7-Eleven at night. Uh, and he would look for people who, you know, and say, would you like to get a new living situation? Um, and they really didn't care um, who was signing on the dotted line. They encouraged people to misrepresent their incomes. Uh, if they didn't have jobs, if they didn't have, um, uh, if they weren't citizens, uh, it didn't matter. The important thing was to get these people into loans. These loans would then be resold back to the banks. The banks in turn would put them into big pools. They would chop them up into a kind of financial hamburger and then sell them off to institutional investors like pension funds and insurance funds. Um, and, and they would wave this hocus pocus math on, on the whole pool of loans and a, peel a piece of it off and that piece would be a AAA rated security. So it was like a magic trick. You took a whole bunch of people who are individually junk rated loans. Each one of these loans was junk rated, uh, but you, when you threw them in the pool, they could suddenly sort of shake up this pool and take a piece of it and turn it into a AAA rated loan. So it was. It was taking something that was cheap and plentiful and not worth very much and turning it into gold. It was like the, the Rumpelstiltskin fairy tale. And at its core, again, it was just fraud. Uh, it was these banks in particular, they knew that a lot of these loans were very likely to default. Um, one of the best examples uh, was a story that I did uh, eventually about one bank uh, where the quality control people was looking at a, a $900 million pool of loans and they knew that 40% um, uh, of the people in that pool had overstated their incomes, uh, and yet they sold, they sold all those loans anyway to investors like you and me and to state pension funds and insurance companies. Uh, and this is absolutely no different in any way uh, from a car dealer who has a lot full of cars with faulty brakes and sells them to customers anyway, even though he knows they're gonna crash as soon as they leave the lot. It's exactly the same kind of activity. Uh, except that it sounds more complicated and it's done in a different way and so we don't think of it as the same kind of, uh, same kind of scam, but it is. Um, and in fact, in the case of the mortgage situation, it was actually even worse than that because many of these companies um, got wise to the fact that they were pumping the economy full of these hundreds of millions and, and even uh, uh, billions of dollars worth of these faulty loans and they realized that they could if they wanted to make money coming and going. So they started to bet against their own products. Uh, 
they would sell hundreds of millions of dollars of these mortgage bonds, and then they would, they would essentially take out bets against those same bonds. So it was kind of like selling cars with faulty brakes, and then taking out life insurance policies on the drivers at the same time. Uh, it was an ingenious scam. And this was sort of the backstory to the AIG bailout, because AIG was essentially Wall Street's bookie. Uh, this was where uh, a lot of these companies were taking out an insurance-like product on their own bonds, uh, or bonds like the ones that they had sold. Uh, these things were called credit default swaps. And when AIG uh, cr crumbled under the weight of all of these, uh, these bets, um, that's when Wall Street ran to the federal government and demanded that the federal government, i.e. all of us here, taxpayers, step in and pay off all those bets uh, that they made. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons that AIG was rescued. Of course, there was a stability of the economy issue there as well, but it was also to make sure that they got paid. So it was, um, it was an ingenious scam, but again, at its heart, it really wasn't all that complicated. It was just fraud in the same way that any, any other kind of fraud was fraud. But it wasn't presented that way in the media. It was presented as an economic story. Uh, when you read the, the financial news explanations of what happened, they often said that it was just an accident, that, um, that Wall Street brokers simply misread the mortgage market. They used terms like a thousand year flood to talk about how unusual it was. Uh, that everybody got it wrong at the same time. It wasn't, any, it wasn't that. It was an intentional scheme to defraud investors, and that's, it was nothing any more complicated than that. So I started covering stories like this, and then, and then I moved on to other scandals. And one of the interesting things was, because this kind of mass fraudulent activity went virtually unpunished, uh, which was different from the previous precedent in American history. We had had a, a similar sort of nationwide fraud scandal in the late 80s, the SNL crisis, um, and we dealt with it very differently. Uh, we prosecuted uh, over 1,800 people back then. Over 800 people actually went to jail in that crisis. And that was a scandal that was similar in scope, but much smaller uh, in scale. In this case, there were, there were two prosecutions and zero, um, uh, zero convictions. Uh, so there was a completely different response to the crisis. Uh, and so, really, the entire industry was really emboldened. I mean, if they're not gonna punish anybody for committing crimes, why not commit more? Uh, and so there was sort of this epidemic of other stuff that happened uh, contemporaneously with 2008 and then afterwards. And again, at their heart, they sounded complicated on the surface, but they were really, uh, just exaggerated versions of common criminal schemes, common organized crime schemes, except that they emanated from Wall Street and not from the street. Uh, one of them was the LIBOR scandal, uh, which, in which a cartel of banks, every day they get together and they, they submit data to this thing called the London Interbank Offered Rate. Uh, they submit data about how much money, it, how much it costs for banks to borrow from each other. That data is then aggregated and turned into a number called LIBOR. And LIBOR is what virtually all kinds of interest rates are based upon. If anybody here has a floating rate interest card, uh, a credit card, or a mortgage, uh, if anybody ever trades in currencies or even has any kind of money at all, all of this is affected by LIBOR rates. And the banks were submitting phony numbers. They were, they were rigging the rates. Uh, this was affecting uh, hundreds of trillions of dollars of financial products, uh, and virtually anybody in the world who had any kind of connection to the modern economy was impacted by this criminal activity, uh, and yet it got very little press here in America. Uh, there have been a few indictments overseas, uh, but here in the States, the response has been almost uh, rel relatively uh, small. Uh, most, the only real consequences for any of these companies is that they've had to pay fines. Uh, and some of those fines, incidentally, were tax deductible. Um, and so LIBOR was just an, an, an exaggerated version of a common mafia scam. It was a cartel price fixing kind of a story, except that it was done on a scale that had never been seen before in human, human civilization. So uh, we didn't recognize it as, as being the low rent criminal scheme that it was. Um, then there was the Jefferson County, Alabama scandal, where uh, a series of banks 
uh, got together and uh, essentially, through a middleman, bribed some local politicians in the Birmingham, Alabama area to get them into a toxic swap deal that ended up costing the county about $3 billion. Uh, the county has since had to declare bankruptcy and will probably be in bankruptcy for the next generation. Um, and they achieved this mainly by inviting the county commissioner on a shopping trip to New York. Uh, they bribed him, they gave him a credit card and let him buy new suits and watches. Uh, and then when he went back to Alabama, they told him to sign on the dotted line. And he did and bankrupted the county for a generation. So that's just a common bribery scandal. Uh, it's a crime like any other crime, but uh, nobody, nobody from the banks was indicted. The local politicians actually were indicted in that case, but the actual financial criminals uh, somehow got off scot-free. Then there was the worst case of all, which was the HSBC case. Uh, I'm sure some of you here heard about this one, but this was in 2011 when HSBC, which is Europe's largest bank, uh, and England's largest bank, uh, got caught up in a uh, money laundering scandal where the bank, uh, among other things, uh, in including laundering money for people on terrorist watch lists, laundering money for rogue nations, uh, among other things, they also admitted to laundering over $800 million for a pair of Central and South American drug cartels uh, including the notorious Sinaloa drug cartel in Mexico. And the punishment for this activity, and incidentally this was um, not the first time that HSBC had been caught with lax money laundering prevention procedures. It was at least the third time they'd been ordered explicitly by the federal government to clean things up. So they were really in violation of parole. Uh, in one year before 2011, they had been warned over 30 times in, uh, on print that more serious consequences were coming if they didn't fix what they were doing. So they violated their parole about 30 times. Um, and when they finally got caught, when they finally admitted to the biggest drug money laundering case in, in the history of the world, uh, the penalty was a $1.9 billion fine, which a portion of which again was tax deductible, which means we all paid a portion of that. Um, and the only individual penalty was that some of the executives at HSBC had to partially defer their bonuses for five years. Um, so why is this important? Well, there are lots of people in this country who are sitting in jail for a long, long time for drug money laundering. I mean, I talked to, while I was covering this case, I talked to a former federal prosecutor who, worked, who had worked in Miami who told me that, you know, he'd worked in, in Miami in the Miami Vice cocaine years in the 80s, uh, and he told me whenever I wanted to put a drug dealer away, whenever I wanted to add years to his sentence, I would just drop a money laundering charge on him. And he pulled out stacks and stacks of examples of people getting an extra 10 or 15 years for this activity. Uh, and here we go, here's HSBC, which has just admitted uh, to a money laundering case that was so egregious that their, their branches in Mexico were actually built with special teller windows so that drug dealers could slide their boxes of cash uh, into the bank more quickly and efficiently so they wouldn't have to wait online. So it was like a courtesy line for drug dealers uh, in their branches in Mexico. Uh, not one person did one day in jail, paid one cent out of his or her own pocket. The entire fine was paid by shareholders and the taxpayers. Uh, and so there was no individual penalty for any person uh, in that scandal. And yet, there are lots of people in this country who are doing real time for drug dealing, and why? Because they're street drug dealers. That's the difference. It's exactly the same crime, uh, but one set of people does not go to jail, and one set of people does go to jail. And there's a big difference between 10 years and 15 years and no time at all. You know, it's not like a small disparity. So around this time, after, after the HSBC scandal, which happened kind of contemporaneously with LIBOR, uh, not just me, but a lot of other reporters who cover this stuff, the corruption on Wall Street, uh, we started to ask the question, how come nobody's going to jail? How is it possible that, that one scandal after another happens and there's no indictments, there's no criminal investigations, nobody, nobody's getting you know, in trouble for any of this stuff? The New York Times did a big thing about it, the Financial Times covered it, there were a lot of other uh, reporters and I started to ask this question myself, and I, I was getting incredible answers. I remember talking to one former 
federal prosecutor, and I was talking about LIBOR. And, and I said, how, you know, how can nobody, this is the biggest crime in the history of the financial services industry, how can nobody be indicted for it? And he says, well, you know, these aren't crime crimes. Uh, and and that was, I thought that was a really interesting answer. And then, you know, when I was talking about HSBC with another uh, law enforcement official, uh, he gave me this incredible answer. I said, how can nobody go to jail for the HSBC thing? This is a, this is a narco-terrorism case, you know, and they admitted it. It's not like it's even alleged. And he said, well, you know, have you, have you been to a jail? They're, you know, those places are dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it sounds like a joke, but this is it's an important thing because this, this is a, a crucial part of the story is that it's, it's an unquantifiable thing that's in the minds of law enforcement and in regulators is this idea that this kind of offender is not the kind of person who's appropriate for jail. They actually use that term with me. And to really bring this out, I want to read a quote from a guy named Michael Stevens, who was the former um, Inspector General of the FHFA, which is the Federal Housing Finance Authority. And he was talking about how the FHFA had in the past indicted people, but that they we're moving away from that practice because it had bad consequences. And here's what he said. He said, um, my organization has indicted 82 people. Uh, three of those people committed suicide recently. Why do I bring that up? Most of the people that we deal with are not hardened criminals. They're white collar. They're highly educated. They belong to churches. They have no prior arrest records. They're pillars of society. They're all making tremendous amounts of money, and when they do get caught, it's a little bit more difficult for them to take than it is for a street criminal. So the rationale here is that because it's harder for this kind of person to go to jail, let's not send them there. Uh, and it, as crazy as that sounds, um, that I think is a significant uh, part of this whole phenomenon is that when law enforcement looked at a lot of these crimes and said, yeah, well, sure, they're crimes, and sure, there was fraud of, in the hundreds of millions, and sure, this affected a lot of people, and people lost their jobs, and, you know, if, when you think specifically about, for instance, the subprime mortgage crisis, you know, think about what those crimes actually meant, okay? So if you, oh, you have a, uh, you're a teacher, and you, and you have a state pension, uh, and your pension fund was sold phony mortgage-backed securities that collapsed in 2008, you might have lost 30 or 40 percent of your retirement income. These people stole that money from you. Uh, and yet, when the regulators looked at these people, they said, well, we can't really send these kinds of people to jail because that's not the kind of person that we send to jail. That, that person won't do well in jail. Let's, let's instead get financial settlements for these kinds of people. And they would, they would also offer up excuses. They would say, what good would it do uh, to put that person in jail. That doesn't accomplish anything. You know what accomplishes something is let's, let's get $8 billion from J.P. Morgan Chase or, or $7 billion from, from Citigroup, and we can do some good with that money. And so that's, that was part of the thinking uh, behind this whole thing. And I, when I decided at that moment, right after the HSBC case, that I was going to write a book about this, I realized that in order to understand exactly how crazy this was, if it was crazy, I needed to understand a little bit more about who does go to jail in this country and why, and that was something I really didn't know a whole lot about. And this process for me really started um, on the day of the HSBC announcement. I was watching the announcement actually on the internet, and I, when I saw that they weren't going to get any time, there was going to be no indictments, I called up a, uh, a public defender in Brooklyn, uh, very close to where they were making the announcement, and I said, what's the dumbest drug case that you had today? And she said, well, come on down to the courthouse, I'll find somebody for you. So I, uh, I ran to the courthouse, and this, this lawyer found a person for me who had been sentenced that morning to 40 days in Rikers for possession of marijuana. Uh, he had a joint in this pocket, which incidentally in New York City uh, isn't against the law. It's been decriminalized since 1977. Uh, as long as you have a joint in your pocket and you don't, you're not openly toking up on the street and getting high, uh, they're not supposed to arrest you. 
But under stop and frisk, what do they do? They stop people who they think look sketchy, and of course there's often a racial bias there. Uh, you know, 88 or 89 percent of all the people who were stopped and frisked in New York were uh, black or brown. They were non, the people of color, uh, and. What they do is they force you to open your, empty your pockets, uh, and if you have a joint in your pocket, you pull it out, now all of a sudden it's open in plain view, and it's a crime. Uh, and so they create a crime out of, out of whole cloth, and that's how, the, in that same year, there were over 50,000 arrests for marijuana possession uh, in New York City, despite the fact that marijuana possession is essentially decriminalized in that city. So this person, who is really a vagrant, uh, whose prior offenses had been for things like sleeping on a park bench. Um, this person who is at the very bottom of the illegal nar narcotics pyramid, one might even call him a victim of the, of the illegal drugs trade, uh, got a harsher sentence, 40 days in one of the most vicious jails in America than anybody at HSBC uh, for, do for doing you know, things that were at the very top of the illegal drugs pyramid. I mean, these were people who were essentially handmaidens to Pablo Escobar, uh, they get off without a day, and this, this essentially homeless person um, gets 40, 40 days in Rikers Island. Um, and so I started to look into this whole phenomenon of community policing. You know, what is that? Uh, you know, it has this very ben uh, benevolent sounding name, community policing, that has this ring that, that the police are out there meeting people on the streets, getting to know the people in their community. Uh, in fact, it's, you know, it turns out to be this, some, this horrible, awful thing that, um, you know, where police in New York uh, and other cities uh, who had other versions of this kinds of policy were uh, stopping people uh, who sort of fit the description or fit the profile, uh, and it got up to about 880,000 stops a year in New York at one point. Uh, and they searched people, and they collected data on these people. They were collecting intelligence on who their friends were and, and who they were hanging out with. They, and the ostensible reason was that they were looking for guns and warrants and serious criminals. Um, but the, you know, the collateral damage of all this is that a lot of innocent people got swept up uh, in this sort of dragnet approach to fighting crime. And I found these incredible examples of overreaches uh, in the criminal justice system. And the most amazing to me was this guy uh, I met in a lawyer's office in Brooklyn named um, Andrew Brown. Andrew was, a, uh, at the time, a 35-year-old African-American bus driver uh, who had been arrested for uh, obstructing pedestrian traffic. Uh, and he's telling me this in, in the law office, and I said, what's, what's obstructing pedestrian traffic? And he pulls out his summons, his little pink piece of paper and it's written there and there's a, it's apparently part of the disorderly conduct statute. Andrew was on his way home from his shift driving a casino bus, gets off the bus after midnight. Uh, he's walking to uh, his, his house in Bedford-Stuyvesant, it's a, an apartment building. Sees a friend in the street, he wants to, uh, to share with the friend a, a, a song that he'd been mixing. Uh, so they're both listening to music on an MP3 player, each one has a piece of a uh, you know, a headphone, and some police saw them, and they automatically assumed that it was a drug deal because it was two African-American males on the street in the middle of the night. Uh, when they demanded that Andrew produce identification, he refused, so they arrested him uh, with obstructing pedestrian traffic on an empty street. So this is a guy standing in front of his own place of residence uh, in the middle of the night with nobody around. They arrest him for this. He had to go to the station, he was strip searched. Uh, strip searching, by the way, is an unbelievably common uh, uh, plot element of a lot of these stories. Uh, I don't know why that is, but somebody should investigate that at some point. Anyway, um, Andrew, I followed his whole progress with this case, and incidentally, he hadn't been arrested, he'd been caught, he'd been arrested for this many times before. It's a very common, um, a violation in the stop and frisk era if it's not obstructing pedestrian traffic. It's often something they call OGA or obstructing government administration, which essentially can mean anything. If a police officer tells you to move, uh, move off a corner and you don't do it quickly enough, they can call that OGA. Uh, if you're standing in front of an elevator in a project building, they can call that OGA. So um, for almost any reason, uh, they can ring you up 
uh, on these charges. And then if, you, if they don't like your attitude when they want to bring you into the station for it, uh, they can charge you with resisting arrest, which incidentally they're trying to make a felony now in New York City. Um, because you can't have resisting without an underlying crime. So you have this underlying phony crime, you know, it's, it's obstructing pedestrian traffic on an empty street, and then you can probably add on this other charge like resisting arrest. Anyway, it ultimately it took Andrew almost a year to get this case dismissed, and his own lawyer um, didn't understand his own court-appointed lawyer wanted him to plead out, and when he explained that he wouldn't plead out to the crime of standing on his own, in front of his own house, the lawyer didn't understand why, he got very angry, they had to give him a new lawyer, uh, and finally, they got a lawyer who entered a not guilty plea, and it was only after a judge insisted finally on asking a police officer if there was anybody on the street, and after some wrangling, he admitted that there was not, that this case was dismissed, and it took over a year to do that. And this was, uh, he was one of the lucky ones. Now, there were lots of people who get caught up for things like riding a bicycle the wrong way on a sidewalk. And in, this, in New York City that year, there were, there were 30,000 people who got arrested for that. Uh, having an open container of alcohol. This is a really interesting one, uh, because there was a judge in New York who somewhat uh, disingenuously, uh, you know, a white judge named Noah Deer, uh, who was sentencing somebody for having an open container of alcohol, and he was kind of thinking out loud, and he said, you know what, I've never, I've never sentenced a white person for this offense before. <laughs> so he says this in open court, um, and because there was a bit of an uproar about it, he, he got his staff to look into the matter, and they found that in New York City, uh, where there are uh, roughly 70,000 open container violations every year, only 4% of those uh, involve white people in a city that's over half white. Um, so even, so there's that, there was this incredible sort of epidemic of false arrests is what somebody in Baltimore called it, this constant uh, dragging people into the system on these small offenses and people get into the system that way and then, and you know, the next time around, the the fines get bigger and the penalties get harsher and sometimes you're denied bail and sometimes you end up actually doing time in jail. Because you're going to court appearances, you get in trouble at work and the whole thing becomes incredibly complicated and incredibly destructive to communities. And it's exactly the opposite of what happens in this white collar arena where, you, where nobody ever has any individual consequence. The whole thing is dealt with by lawyers in a room somewhere. Everything goes away no matter how big the crime is. The actual perpetrator never has to physically go anywhere, never has to do time, never has to pull any money out of his or her own pocket. Even in cases where the actual crime is the same, the treatment is incredibly different. So to give you an example, um, when I had to learn about how they deal with welfare fraud, um, in the state of California, for instance, when you are on public assistance, in San, in San Diego, incidentally, by the way, they, they have a program called P100 uh, where they preemptively search your home to see if you're, if you're committing fraud on your welfare application. So when you fill out a welfare form, you actually have to wait at your house and somebody will come and search your home. And I talked to women who told stories about the inspectors going through their underwear drawer and picking out panties and saying, you know, if you don't have a boyfriend living at the house, then what do you need these for? Uh, you know, these incredibly violative and horrible stories. Uh, but beyond that, the mechanism for catching people for fraud is that quarterly you have to fill out these forms where it says, I, the undersigned, swear to, and then you have to fill out several pages of documents where you swear that you don't own a car, that you have, your, your assets are less than $3,000, you're not cohabiting with anybody. There's a whole bunch of different things that you have to attest to. And there are computers constantly monitoring all these, these, uh, these fields. So if you fill out this form and then suddenly you try to buy a car uh, or you register for a car, uh, a fraud case is sort of automatically generated. And the possibility of, over, of winning one of these fraud charges is so small that uh, most legal aid uh, offices don't even have people who, will, uh, who are there in place to defend against them. Once you're charged with welfare fraud, you effectively lose. 
uh, in 99% of the cases. And the consequences are incredible. I mean, people can lose uh, custody of their kids, their family members can lose access to other benefits like Section 8 housing. And additionally, you, you, can, you can do time in jail if the, you know, if, if the courts rule that way. Um, and this is for simple fraud, which remember is the same thing that, you know, that banker for J.P. Morgan Chase who knowingly sold a pool of loans that he knew was 40% overstated and likely to default. Uh, for that $900 million fraud, uh, there is no penalty whatsoever, but for the person, you know, the single mom who's had to go through the humiliating experience of applying for welfare in the first place, for receiving $250 too much, the consequences can be enormous. So there's this enormous difference in the individual consequences of the same crime. And so, Having looked at this and having seen both sides of the coin, I started to ask the question of why this is, and, there, and I know we're getting towards the end, but I want to go through some of the answers that, that I found um, in my research. And one of them is that it's simply a difference in allocation of resources. There are simply fewer law enforcement personnel watching uh, this one white collar group of offenders, while there's an enormous number of uh, police and law enforcement people watching this other group. Uh, and I think the most vivid example I can give is AIG. AIG, of course, was at the center of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, there were all sorts of allegations uh, that the, they were involved in some improper activities, that they had misrepresented the health of their company to investors uh, in the period right before AIG exploded. Um, but AIG, uh, as a result of some very clever lobbying by the finance industry. Um, like a lot of other companies, had, had won the right to choose its own regulator. And uh, AIG had chosen the Office of Thrift Supervision uh, because AIG, even though it's primarily an insurance company and a financial company, it did own one thrift company, which a thrift is an SNL, basically. Uh, so they were regulated by a savings and loan regulator. Uh, and on the staff of the Office of Thrift Supervision, there was exactly one insurance expert. So here's AIG, you know, the world, one of the world's largest insurance companies, 180,000 employees, and it's effectively being regulated by one person. Uh, and to make a kind of facile comparison, just look at the Eric Garner case. You know, here's a guy who's selling 75 cent cigarettes uh, on Staten Island, and he's surrounded by 10 police officers. And I know that sounds like a, you know, a made up, uh, you know, fanciful comparison, but it's absolutely a real one. The, the reality is that there are very, very few people watching out for uh, certain kinds of wrongdoing. The, the, the few highly trained financial professionals who are watching out for white collar crime are usually watching out for stuff that they know how to prosecute, like insider trading. The rest of this stuff, the subprime mortgage fraud, the LIBOR manipulation, the bid rigging of the, in the municipal bond industry, the, the myriad other schemes that have gone on and gone unpunished recently, there's basically nobody looking out for any of that stuff. Another thing is that the lobbyist influence. Uh, the financial industry has, can do something that drug dealers can't do, which is they can go to Washington and ask to have their activities legalized. Um, a great example is the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, which was a, a, a radical deregulatory law that was passed uh, in the waning days of the Clinton administration, which uh, essentially deregulated all derivatives, which were, among other things, the kinds of instruments that were used to package those bad mortgages. The Commodity Futures Modernization Act has an amazing clause in it. Uh, it says that um, state gaming laws may not be used uh, to apply to, the to derivative instruments. So even though uh, many types of derivative trading are exactly like gambling, in fact, there's a, there's a thing called a naked credit default swap, which is really just two financial actors betting on whether or not a third financial actor uh, pays his or her bills. Uh, it's kind of like taking an insurance policy out on somebody else. Um, 
that's exactly like it. It's, it is gambling, and because it's exactly like gambling, the industry had to go to Washington and, and affirmatively ask that, that that activity not be regulated by local, uh, local police in, in, in states, even though it might actually violate state gambling laws. But of course, a drug dealer can't go to Washington and ask that, uh, you know, that, that you can sell uh, drugs, you know, if, as long as it's 1,500 yards away from a school or something like that. Uh, they just don't have that opportunity. Um, another reason is, is, uh, is that prosecutors are afraid of juries. They often use the excuse that juries don't understand this stuff. Uh, it's too complicated for them, so they don't want to risk it. They do a kind of cost-benefit analysis, and I had one Law enforcement official just put it to me plainly. Look, we know we can make 50 drug cases. Um, for that same amount of resources, we might be tied up for 10 years uh, in court fighting the best lawyers in the world um, in a case that A, a jury might not get, and B, we might lose uh, with because uh, you know, we're up against the best talent in the world and they have more resources than we do. So they decided to go and, you know, the, to do the, the smart thing from a cost-benefit analysis and just get more convictions. Uh, and it's easier to get convictions against people who are poorly defended. It just is. So they, they make that analysis. And another thing, I think the final reason that I thought was probably the scariest is this thing that they talk about called collateral consequences. Um, and this was the brainchild of Eric Holder uh, back when he was a little-known official in the Clinton Justice Department, he wrote a memo which came to be known um, effective, uh, affectionately as the Holder Memo, uh, where he gave guidelines to prosecutors who were, uh, who were prosecuting financial crime. And he said, if you're going after one of these big companies that, that uh, employs a lot of people and you're concerned about the impact that it may have on innocent people, like executives not involved in the wrongdoing or you know, the pe people who live in the community where the company is headquartered, or just the, the line employees who maybe didn't have anything to do with it, uh, then you may consider the quote-unquote collateral consequences of that prosecution, and you may consider alternative remedies, non-criminal remedies, or deferred prosecution agreements, or non-prosecution agreements, or, or fines. Um, and so, back in 1999, you know, this is something that might have applied in a few cases, uh, but by 2008, when we'd seen this explosion of too big to fail companies, it essentially became the unofficial policy of the Justice Department to, to worry about the collateral consequences when they thought about prosecuting companies like HSBC or UBS, the Swiss bank. And when people like Eric Holder and, and the former criminal division chief, Lanny Brewer, openly said, you know, we were worried about the impact that prosecuting these firms might have on, on the world economy, and so, you know, we're going to pursue some other kind of remedy. Lanny Brewer actually told Frontline in an interview that um, worrying about the consequences of prosecuting people from a company like HSBC kept him up at night. Uh, and you know, while the consequences of those prosecutions may actually be mind-boggling and it might be frightening for a prosecutor to think about, think about the, the you know, the, the callousness of that statement because there are enormous collateral consequences for anybody who gets caught up in the criminal justice system. You know, uh, uh, wives lose their husbands, uh, you know, people lose their children, they lose custody of their kids, their relatives lose their benefits, you lose your jobs, you lose your career. When you get out of jail, when uh, you know you're, it's impossible to get back into the economy in any meaningful way, all that pain fans out into communities. And yet, when they're worrying about collateral consequences, the the, the Justice Department says, "Well, we, you can consider that when you're dealing with these big companies." But they're never explicitly asked to consider the collateral consequences of prosecuting ordinary people. Um, and so. Sort of in summation, I want to tell a story about an experience that I had when I was a student um, in the Soviet Union. I, I am actually old enough to have gone to school in Soviet Russia. Uh, but one of the things that I noticed when I was a student in Leningrad back in 1990 
um, was that there were these people who came to our dorms every day who were trading rabbit hats and trying to trade dollars with us and uh, you know buy foreign goods or sell foreign goods. Um, and you know, I got to know these people. They were called Farsoshiki, or they were black market dealers. Uh, and every now and then, these guys would get picked up by the cops and they would disappear for you know, a few weeks or a few months. And uh, then they would come back and that was fine. But the funny thing was, what they were arrested for was trading dollars and, and having foreign goods. And they would get arrested. And meanwhile, the college president would walk right by the same cops wearing a Savile Row suit or some other foreign, foreign item that he had bought from one of these people. Uh, and the cops wouldn't even look at that person. And when I would talk to Russians about this, they would laugh because after so many years in the Soviet system, you know, the Soviet people, the Russians, they learned that there were really two different sets of laws. There was the written set of laws, which was basically meaningless, and then there was the unwritten set of laws, which was the meaningful set of laws. And all citizens had learned to do these kinds of silent calculations about who's allowed to do what, what line can you cross, you know that a street kid can't can't sell or buy you know, a pair of, of French socks on the street, uh, but the college president can wear those socks and, and walk right by the same police officer uh, without worrying about a risk because this kind of person doesn't go to jail and this kind of person does go to jail. And it's just something that you inherently understand. Um, and it didn't even offend the Soviet people until the country collapsed and it was like everybody woke up from a dream at the same time and they realized how absurd it was. And I think we're, we're kind of, you know, not to be dramatic about it, but I think we're kind of headed in the same direction because when we read about these stories, um, we know is sort of inherently that there's a difference in the way people are gonna be treated. Uh, to give you an example, there was a story in the early 2000s about a, a guy named, a 19 year old kid named uh, Jason Williams from a little town called Tulia, Texas, um, who got 45 years in jail for selling an, an eighth of an ounce of cocaine uh, within a thousand yards of a school zone. Uh, it was his first uh, offense. He'd never been arrested before, uh, but there was a series of enhancements in Texas for selling near a school zone, despite the fact that half the residences in the city of Tulia were within a thousand yards of a school. Um, this kid got 45 years in jail. He's still in jail today. Uh, meanwhile, not that long after that, uh, a company called uh, Forest Ph Pharmaceuticals got caught up uh, in a scheme where they had suppressed the results of a study uh, that showed that the antidepressant Celexa caused suicidal behavior in adolescents. They had suppressed that study and they had illegally uh, and in defiance of the FDA, uh, marketed this drug to uh, school kids uh, and to adolescents. And so here you have two crimes that are pretty much, you know, in, in certain, certain ways, they're very, very similar. It's a marketing of an, Im of an illegal pharmaceutical, a dangerous ph pharmaceutical, as it turns out, uh, to people in a school, uh, to underage people in a school. One person, African American, you know, on the street, gets 45 years, and Forest Pharmaceutical uh, gets away with a $143 million fine, no indictments, no individual penalties, no executives ever have to be involved in the entire transaction. And again, it's, uh, when you read these stories, yes, the number 45 years might raise a few eyebrows here and there, but the fact that that person went to jail and these people didn't go to jail it doesn't really surprise any of us because we just sort of understand instinctively that that's the way it is. Um, and that's really the dangerous part of the situation. You know, the Soviet Union was a dysfunctional society because it had two sets of rules, one written and one unwritten. Um, and we're headed in the same direction, I think. Uh, our system of law, works better when laws are written and when everybody has to follow the same sets of laws and they should apply to everyone equally. Um, anyway, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and I'm happy to take uh, questions and answers.
For those of you who would like to ask a question, if you could step up to one of the mics, and um, Matt will take a few questions. Hi. Do you have any sense of which comes first, the inequality of income and resources, or the inequality of treatment by the criminal justice system? That's a great question. I think it's funny because when I, when I wrote this book, there were a lot of people who were looking at the inequality, income inequality question. I think the two things are linked, they're inter interrelated. Um, one of the things that I talked about a lot is that judges I saw in courtrooms, they tended to look down upon people who had committed crimes of financial need. Uh, if somebody had committed a robbery because they didn't have any money, that was offensive to them on some level, whereas you know, the executive who commits the crime of intellectual choice just because he wants to get more money, somehow that's okay in our society. And I, I think. I think there's a, this idea that needing money is, is the really wrong thing that, peop, that is at the root of all this. That's what we're, that's what we're really criminalizing. Um, so I think it's the two things are just, I guess the answer is the two things are interrelated. Uh, we, we create poor people by this activity, but also it's a symptom of how we treat poor people. Matt, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, you know, I think last year, J.P. Morgan saw, I can't remember if it was 11 or $13 million fine. The, the billion. Biggest, $13 billion, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest fine in history, I think. We've seen, you know, Hillary Clinton has gotten a lot of pushback for her ties to, uh, you know, Wall Street. Is there any kind of shift in, in any substantial shift in the way this is seen? And then just a quick follow-up. I think a lot of people were kind of looking forward to Racket uh, coming online. Would there be any kind of ideation of that that we might be able to see in the next, in any foreseeable future? Uh, well, I'll answer that last part first. No, uh, I, don't, I don't work for that company anymore. So I'm back at Rolling Stone and, and um, I'm you know, writing books again. So, uh, but about you know, a sea change, you know, Chase paid they were hit with a $13 billion settlement. Actually, in reality, it was a $9 billion settlement. If you did the math a certain way, the, you know, $4 billion of that was really forgiveness of um, uh, homeowner obligations, which d didn't come out of Chase's pocket. Another portion of that uh, fine was, again, tax deductible. So when you really got down to it, it wasn't that big of a fine. And it was, um, you know, the, the company still turned a profit at the end of the year. Uh, they're, the issue really is these, these companies, they can afford the, the money. It, you know, it doesn't really hurt them in the end. It's the, the issue is whether any individuals are going to pay. Because they, they did even cross the line last summer where they actually criminally charged a couple of foreign banks, uh, Credit Suisse and BNP Paribas, who were both hit with criminal charges uh, for different things. But again, it was no individuals. Nobody, no, no person actually had to pay a penalty. And, um, there's a possibility there are a couple of criminal investigations that are still alive, uh, but you know I, it's, I'm kind of taking the I'll see it when I believe it thing. I think most people feel like it's probably not going to happen. You know. So, thanks. Could you talk about how um, what you've talked about relates to corporate personhood and how furthering the idea of corporate personhood or possibly abolishing it? could either contribute to more accountability or more impunity as it relates to white collar crime? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, what did Ambrose Bierce say about corporations? It's a, an ingenious mechanism for individual profit without individual responsibility, right? Uh, and this whole episode was a perfect example of that because what happened? Uh, enormous, massive crimes were committed, right? Uh, and in the few cases where people, where the companies were actually caught, there was, there was no individual consequence. The only consequence was for the corporation, which is 
technically a person but doesn't feel any pain. The only pain is felt by the shareholders. Uh, and so, yes, we're here, we have a situation where if you can commit the crime under the auspices of a big corporation, uh, then really it's, it's like a license to steal. I think if they, if they maybe either abolish corporate personhood or at least made it so that all penalties had to redound to some kind of a person uh, in the end, um, that would be, instead of a corporate person, I think that would, that would put a dent in this problem for sure. All right, so a lot of us knew that it was bad, but maybe not how bad it was, so it's pretty <laughs> eye-opening, thank you. Um, you kind of touched on it a little bit just now. Is there anything that can be done about what you just told us about for the last hour? Yeah, the solutions question, right? Um, which I don't do too well at. Uh, it's tough. I mean, the, the problem with this whole issue is, is when you boil down all of these problems, it all comes down to money and politics. Um, and, you know, how do you overcome a system where, for instance, all the regulators, the high-ranking high regulators in places like the SEC or the CFTC or the OCC, these financial regulators, they all know that when they leave government that they have a two or three or four million dollar a year partnership waiting for them. Um, you know, Robert Kuzami, the former head of the SEC Enforcement Division, just left a couple of years ago and he's making five million dollars a year now um, in, a, in a law firm in New York. Uh, so, you know, where's the incentive for regulators to go really hard against any of these companies when they know that there's this big fat NBA level contract waiting for them when they get out of office. Uh, there's no incentive. And so we've, we've, we're seeing this flowering of uh, these sort of corporate defense type uh, people in the regulatory uh, areas where, you know, people like Eric Holder and Lanny Brewer, who both came from Covington and Burling, uh, which had represented all of these companies that were, had gotten in trouble. And so they're inherently conflicted, and these companies give an enormous amount of money to both parties, and so it's just the whole thing is difficult. What do you do about it? You have to somehow break the chain of, of money and politics and, and politicians relying on the easy money that they get from Wall Street uh, because what they're going to do is they're going to nominate people to these regulatory positions who are going to go who are going to go soft in these companies, and then those people are going to go back to work for Wall Street when they're done, and it's, the whole process is going to start all over again. I don't know how you fix it. I mean, in the age of Citizens United, we're farther away from a solution than we were um, before. Uh, the the more money you have, the more the more influence you have, and and conversely, because we're not prosecuting that kind of offender. They're, they're prosecuting defenseless people in their place. The, the, you know, it's, it, the lack of money uh, is becoming a weakness for another kind of person. And, and so those people are increasingly become victims of the criminal justice system. So I don't know. I, I, they have to do something to fix this, that whole problem because money shouldn't have anything to do with justice, but it does. Is this more of a recent issue, or has this been going on for a long time? And is this just strictly related to the United States, or is this more of an international issue? Well, clearly, rich people have always had it easier. The poor people have always had the business end of every government in history. I don't think that's, that's a newsflash, but I, it is. The reason it's interesting now is because it has clearly and quantitatively gotten worse than it was even 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, again, to bring up the SNL crisis example, um, not only did we prosecute 1,800 people after that, not only uh, did uh, 800 people go to jail after that, not only did we have defendants from the other scandals involving people, the junk bond scandals like Mike Milken, they all went to jail, um, but for, 
The other, the sort of non-prosecutorial regulators, the groups like the OCC, uh, even sort of quasi-private regulators like the New York Stock Exchange, uh, back in those days they were sending thousands of what they call criminal referrals every year to the, to the Justice Department. Uh, essentially they were starting to make cases against offenders and they would deliver these cases sort of half done to the prosecutors to finish them off. Uh, these days, uh, the regulators are not delivering referrals anymore at all. The numbers were closer to zero in the years after 2008. Uh, and so it's not just the, S the S SNL scandal was, was sort of one example. Ten years later, you had the accounting control scandals with Enron and Tyco and Adelphia and WorldCom where we didn't put as many people in jail, but we did put a lot of key executives symbolically uh, on trial. That was the Bush administration. They at least did that. And then eight years after that, we had this enormous, you know, beyond all, all comprehension, much bigger uh, financial scandal, and the number of people brought to trial was zero. So we've seen this pro a, a steady progression. Um, mm. I think it is quantitatively worse now in the United States. Uh, we, and in terms of whether it's worse here than in other places, well, in, in the industrialized world, um, the problem is that America, it's one of its last commercial advantages is that people saw uh, our financial system as being relatively clean. And so that's why we've been a place where the Saudis and the Japanese and the Indonesians want to keep their money because they think we're not dirty. Well, that's changing now because they think we are dirty. Um, and that's a problem. That hasn't been true before. So I, I, I do think it's, you know, we maybe we're not as bad as some other places, but, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, and, and people on Wall Street, all my sources are, are Wall Street people. They're all hardcore capitalists. Uh, they're not lefties. They, they, they want... They want business to go back to being honest capitalist business, and they hate what's happened to their business because they're, they're losing their reputation. So, um, sorry, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but, but yeah, it is getting worse. Yes, sir. Hey, when this whole uh, bank bailout went down, you know, I had no clue what was going on, and I followed your pieces in Rolling Stone and explained the derivatives very good, so thank you for that. Oh, okay. um, so with your friends on Wall Street and whatnot, we, the, the bank bailout is behind us. Now we're looking at this oil shale boom, and the gas prices have gone down, and I know there's a lot of monies and derivatives for oil and whatnot. Uh, right. Do you have any pulse on that? Are we looking at a bailout for the oil industry coming up? Any, and I know, you know I'm not asking for a solid for a stock comment, tip. Yeah, 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 just, just, just wondering your pulse on it right now. Is there another one looming in the future, in your opinion? You know, I don't know. Every now and then I get these apocalyptic phone calls from people on the street who say, it's coming, man, you know, duck, you know, and, and the last time was when quantitative easing came to an end. Everybody thought that that was going to result in this, well, it didn't come to an end, they, they slowed it down. Um, and this was when the government was pumping, you know, trillions of dollars of invented money into the economy to sort of prop up all these different markets when they tapered that off. Uh, there was concern that there would be collapse in, in various industries that this money had gone to or had forced you know, private investment to go. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the problem is with all these derivatives is that everything is so interconnected now. If, if you have a crash in any particular industry, um, the consequences can radiate out everywhere instantaneously because um, everything is pegged to everything else. That's what we saw in, in 2008 where you know, all these different actors had uh, swaps and derivative contracts that were based on everybody else's investments. And so when Bear Stearns went under, everybody else could have gone under. And, that, and that's what's so dangerous about the economy is not just, it's not just the, the amount of debt and leverage that's piled up underneath all this stuff. It's the interconnectedness that's really the problem, which is, you know, the next time we have a, connect, a correction, it could again have that kind of a, a you know, a, across the economy consequence. So I don't have a specific answer for you, except that everybody says it's dangerous. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, being a black man in America, um, I have, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. I was thinking about it on the way up. I am around a lot of black people and they, you know, there's a many, many, many talks 
that um, always get a rise. These are people that have masters, doctorates, yada, yada, yada. And I was wondering if you could possibly give some sort of advice in weeding out what is conspiracy and theory versus fact. You mean in terms of like police presence and things like yeah. that? Well, I, I don't think any, there's any question that racism plays a huge factor in all of these policies. I mean, uh, whether it's an active conspiracy, whether a bunch of people got together and said, we're really gonna stick it to, to the black community, I don't think it happened necessarily that way, but it, you know, it's sure, it sure turned out that way, you know? And it's, it's, it's no accident uh, that, that the community policing presence, uh, these constant sort of harassing contacts with the police, that you know, young African American people, especially young young black men. I'm sure you know you you heard the stories. That, you know, white people don't go through this. I lived in New York for for 20 years. I'd never once been stopped by the police for anything. But um, in in other parts of New York, it's incredibly common. That's not. It can't be an accident. It, it, you know, what, whether it was an active conspiracy or not is irrelevant. It's a fact. You know, and uh, the Ferguson study. Uh, that just came out clearly shows uh, an incredible amount of bias in the system right down to these amazing details like the fact that every single person that they had data on who'd ever been bitten by a police dog in Ferguson was African American. Uh, so, you know, the, the bias even radiates down into the, the police dogs. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible and, and I, I think I think white America is an incredible denial about the extent of uh, how bad this problem is, how infuriating it is to be stopped for no reason, um, you know, and how demeaning it is to, to have to go through these interactions constantly. Uh, if it's not a conspiracy, it has the impact of a conspiracy just as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I, it, it's, it's a fact, that's for sure. How's it going, Matt? Hi. Um, I like to uh, think about the difference between the Roaring Twenties and right now. And we often hear comparisons with the, uh, the wealth gap from that time and now. And then um, I remember opening my 10th grade textbook in history class and seeing pictures of um, people who were Wall Street uh, traders back in the day sitting on the side of the street in New York with signs that says, you know, we'll work for food or whatever right. else. Do you remember those pictures? Um, first of all, here's to hoping that the textbooks of our future have pictures of um, Wall Street traders with their golden parachutes. <laughs> um, hopefully that will happen, but um, I'd like to know what you think is the big difference between that then time and this time and why the game is so rigged now. What's the major cause for the shift from the 20s to now as far as like the depression from the recession? That's a great question. Um... It's really interesting because I, I covered the negotiations for Dodd-Frank um, and I remember talking to lots of people in both the House and the Senate and uh, you know the, the, the situations were so similar, right? Because we'd had this explosion of irresponsible and often criminal speculation that resulted in this spectacular speculative boom that collapsed and affected the entire country. and the response back in the 20s, or after, more, more appropriately the 30s, was they said, well, let's, let's create a few simple rules to make the whole thing transparent. Let's put everything, all this stock trading, let's put it on open, regulated exchanges so that everybody can see what the price of everything else is at all times. There's nothing in the dark, right? Um, you know, let's, let's make sure that publicly traded companies have to offer some data so that investors know what's going on, who's making how much, how much the, the executives are making, how much they inv invested in their own companies. Let's shine some light on that, right? These weren't, the regulations weren't like this thick. They were really simple rules that they, that they undertook to clean the whole thing up. There were some people who wanted to do exactly the same thing after this, and they could have with derivatives. They could have created open derivative exchanges where everybody could see the price of everything else and everybody could see when there was too much leverage building up, when people held dangerous positions. 
Um, and they didn't do that. Wall Street successfully bought off enough people in, in the House and the Senate to make sure that these markets stayed opaque uh, and they're in the dark. And so they had an opportunity. There was a moment where they could have said, let's clean the whole thing up, let's make this civilized, let's make it a, a, a booming market. Because derivatives actually have a lot of really positive, interesting, wealth-creating uh, possibilities uh, if they're handled responsibly. But what ended up happening is it became this mechanism for all kinds of crazy, irresponsible gambling that the ordinary person just doesn't understand. And so uh, the major difference is that back then FDR had the political will and, and, and the organization to overcome um, the obstacles, and this time Barack Obama didn't. Uh, whether he wanted to or not, I don't know, but, but certainly the Democrats had an opportunity maybe to, to try to implement something like that, and they just didn't do it. So it was, it's too bad because they had an opportunity. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it.